Hello and welcome to the American Debt Crisis, an online event from the Casey Research Team featuring the senior editors of the Casey Report, uh, Doug Casey, Bud Conrad, Terry Coxon, and myself, as well as some special guests including Olivier Garay, who's the CEO of Casey Research, and John Malden, uh, Lou Rockwell, and Mike Maloney. Uh, to save time for the program, I'm not going to go into everyone's biographies here, but rather would refer you to the bottom of the web browser page that you are currently on. Uh, simply stated, the purpose of today's event is to update our views on the continuing crisis uh, and the measures that you can take to protect yourself as the crisis worsens. Uh, in many ways, this discussion is a continuation of a conversation that uh, was first held in a coffee shop in San Francisco in, two, in November of 2005 when Doug Casey, Terry uh, Coxon, and Bud Conrad and I got together for the first time as a group to discuss our views on the economy. Uh, during that conversation, after it had gone on for a while, uh, we got, uh, and everybody was, was quite gloomy about the prospects for the economy, I, I decided to take a different tact, and so I asked the group uh, to, one at a time, if they could envision a scenario that we would avoid the crisis uh, that was coming, that everyone saw was coming. And one at a time, we went around the table and each person sort of thought about it for a minute and said, nope, there's no way, there's no way out of this. Um, uh, the only hopeful sign was Doug, a uh, comment when he said, well, maybe friendly aliens could land on the roof of the White House and, and share the secret of eternal prosperity for all. But short of that, uh, Doug's comment was, nope, there's no way out. Well, here we are. Uh, several years, well, it's six years later, uh, the crisis that these gentlemen uh, had foreseen in, in November 2005, and which had, which we've covered in great detail uh, ahead of the event, and of course during and after, or as, it on, as it's ongoing, in the Casey report, uh, these guys called it. Most of the people, well, Bernanke didn't see it coming. Uh, most of your financial experts didn't see it coming, but these guys saw it. So. Uh, the purpose of this program now is to, is to try to visualize uh, where things go from here. Uh, how much longer could this uh, crisis uh, go? How deep could it get? How bad could it get? Uh, and, and most importantly, sort of how you, the viewers, can protect yourselves from, uh, from what's coming. Um, so we've got, a, we've got a lot to cover here, and I want to get straight to it. Um, by sort of asking uh, our panelists to describe, you know, sort of where are we at this point? You know, what, where, where is, what is the state of the global economy? And I'll, I'll toss that question over to uh, Doug to start. Well, um, those of us who study economics, and by that I mean Austrian economics, not varieties of witchcraft and political apology like Keynesianism, Marxism uh, recognized that this crisis that we're in now has been inevitable uh, for many years because of the obvious actions and trend of the U.S. government. But now the inevitable has turned into the imminent. And uh, the way I would put it is this. When we talked in 2005, uh, it was obvious that bad things were going to happen. Uh, then we entered the hurricane, and this is a gigantic hurricane. We entered that hurricane in 2007. Uh, the U.S. and other governments then printed up trillions of currency units to paper it over and make people think that their standard of living hadn't dropped as much as it had. Uh, 2007, 2008, 2009, we entered the eye of the hurricane, uh, if you would, in 2009, 2010. But now, as we speak, we're going back into the hurricane itself. And this is going to be much more severe, uh, much longer lasting, much more serious than what we went through in 2008 and 2009. So fundamentally, the, the, and Bud, you've done a lot of work on this, <clears throat> the, the problems that the government has continually tried to paper over, over the years, and the latest was, of course, the housing bubble. And a lot of people aren't aware that ahead of the Great Depression was the, was the previous very large bubble in real estate. Uh, the, the largest bubble up to this point, I think it was actually bigger than the current one, uh, happened right before the Great Depression uh, back in the 20s. 
Um, so when the housing bubble that we all saw as a bubble uh, finally burst, the government, of course, tried to, to paper it over, and therefore it morphed into a sovereign debt crisis, which is where we are today, and you've written a lot about this. So, I mean, in terms of the, where the economy is today, any comments and how deep yeah. we are? Just to tack on to uh, Doug's nice introduction here, when you have too much private debt that gets taken over by the governments, you get into case of sovereign debt problems. In this case, look at the leader of the pack, Greece. In some sense, there are our Lehman Brothers of the private debt collapse. They are all but declared bankrupt right now. And the point is, they're the lead horse in this battle of which is the weakest country going forward of too much government debt because the governments took on all the bad private debt. And what I'm referring to here was takeovers of Fannie and Freddie, six trillion dollars of bailouts of various kinds from our government to our banking system. And the whole operation and problem is that now our government has got the problem of too much debt. Uh, so, Bud, when does, when does the debt get to 150% of GDP? It's before the decade is out. In fact, uh, we get to the level of crisis basically within two years. And the point is, people can see that coming on this very simple method of calculation, just that we add the amount of debt that we've been adding and that the economy stays at a rather modest, slow growth. It, there is no way out of this mess, as Doug started us out with. Right. I think the answer depends what numbers you take. If you take the uh, forecast from the Cong Congressional Budget Office, it is by the end of the decade. If you take more realistic numbers and assume that there will be escalation in interest rates, right. it can be less than five years. Right. So Doug's yeah. comment that it's not just inevitable but imminent is, is certainly... Uh... Yeah, but I underplayed that actually because uh, we've talked about Western nations, Western Europe, Japan, the U.S., but uh, the elephant in the room is China. And uh, although I'm a huge bull on China, I think that this is going to be the Chinese century, the 21st century. Uh, China is at the peak of a bubble, primarily driven by real estate. That Chinese real estate market is a huge accident waiting to happen, bigger than what happened here in the United States. And when that bubble breaks, it's going to bring down the Chinese banks. And mm -hmm. all those prudent Chinese that have been saving 50% of their income are going to wind up with nothing. And they're going to be really, really unhappy. Then what's going to happen? I remember I had a conversation with a, with a, a guy who spends half his time, a Chinese uh, gentleman who spends half his time in the US and half the time in China. This goes back a number of years ago. And when I asked him what he's doing with his money, he says, oh, I buy real estate in China. and I." and I own Chinese stocks, and I said, well, those both seem very toppy at this point, and aren't you worried that they're going to collapse? And his comment was, it was stunned, and he looked at me and says, well, the government would never let that happen. And, you know, to, to their, well, not to their credit, but in reality, when 2008 hit, they really poured on the monetary juice there. They, came, they, they shot at it with all guns blazing. So, uh, but now they're, they, their inflation is, is, I think, north of 6% at this point. And this officially. is this is a, officially right. This is this is not a, a particularly happy situation. Just yeah, let me just come out and say that all of the currencies of the world are likely to be destroyed over the next decade, and this is a catastrophe of the first order. This is almost as bad as World War III. So we're having a, so we're already in a situation which, <clears throat> you know, the average viewer would would look and say, "My God, it's it's already pretty dismal." Um, but as far as you're concerned. Uh, we haven't seen anything yet? No, no, it's just starting. And my reference to World War III wasn't just a toss away because when things start getting bad, governments in particular like to blame somebody else. It's they caused it. And um, I, I think we're sitting on a military powder keg around the world too. So uh, button down the hatches. The, of course, in times of crisis, I mean, we, you know, looking at the, the history of this crisis, it's clear the government played a central role. I mean, they try to stuck to blame, blame everybody else, but the government certainly was right in the middle of this, guaranteeing loans that should have never been made in the housing sector and so on and so forth. But ultimately, when you have this kind of a problem and people are feeling the economic pain, they don't look to the government to do less. They look to the government to do more. Now, uh, you know, the president has a whole new plan to solve everybody's problems by, you know, the, the usual things, infrastructure spending and this, that, and the other thing. 
Um, but at this point, uh, can the government do anything um, to try to solve this problem? Is it, is it actually unsolvable? I mean, Terry, what are you, what you're thinking? Well, as a political matter, it's unsolvable. Uh, the steps that it would take to rescue the economy are things such as repeal Obamacare, get rid of Sarbanes-Oxley, get rid of uh, Dodd-Frank regulations, eliminate uh, federal minimum wage laws, uh, roll back federal spending to what it was, say, at the turn of the, of the century to, to balance the budget, uh, stop uh, trying to rescue the housing market, uh, just let it decline, uh, adopt a policy of letting failed institutions fail and die rather than keeping mm -hmm. them in an uh, eternal zombie state through, uh, through subsidies and bailouts. Uh, that might do the job for the U.S. economy, but it's not what the politicians are going to do. Right. Maybe I would add raise the retirement age to age 75 or 80. That would help. Right. And stop some wars. Yeah, if, if you could get by in one war at a time, that right. would help. Yeah, it, no, these are good suggestions, but I'm afraid that uh, I don't think you guys are going far enough. Uh, I, I really don't. Uh, at this point, uh, the government's policies have to be attacked, not with just a sharp scalpel, but with a chainsaw. Uh, I actually advocate, let me say something that I'm sure will be shocking, I advocate defaulting on the U.S. national debt. It's going to be defaulted on anyway, through subtly, through inflation. I feel it would be far more honest to actually say, I'm sorry, we're not going to pay any of the U.S. debt. Now, that would have a lot of consequences, but uh, at least it would be uh, honest. And I rather like it from a moral point of view because it's going to punish the people that have financed the U.S. government and its ridiculous depredations all over the world. And of course, you need to do much more. You need to not just cut back, but you need to abolish almost all these government agencies. You need to cut military spending, not by 20% or 30%. You need to cut it by 90%. You, need to, you can abolish the income tax. You certainly need to abolish the Federal Reserve. And uh, commodity should be used as money again. So uh, the trouble is, is nobody's talking about principles. They're all talking about suggestions around the margins. And I, I think this is uh, serious enough that you've got to talk about basic philosophical principles here. It seems to me that the situation, I mean, one of the things that I've noticed lately is that it used to be that you would see these talking heads on CNBC and these other programs uh, all have opinions you know, on how you could solve the problem in sort of conventional methods. And these days, they all sort of end up sort of uh, mumbling things about, well, if, if Congress and the administration can work together, then they can start coming up with some solutions. But, you know, they're, at this point, I mean, the default, nobody's talking about default, which, as you said, is, is probably the only honest way to deal with this. Because then, as you know from being a turnaround guy, then you can start restructuring something. Um, but in, as it is right now, nobody's talking about default. All they're talking about is, you know, moving the chairs around on the on the Titanic, and it's, uh, I, there's nothing, seems to me, from a political standpoint, there's, there's actually no hope uh, of a solution. Well, actually, the Nobel Prize winners are, are talking about the fact that we didn't spend enough. Right. You know, and the fact is, there's already the level of debt is unsustainable, so spending more would just be, uh, I mean, it's just going directly to straight default and liquidation. You know, when right. Congress and the White House work together, that's when the real mischief happens. Right. And let's throw in the Federal Reserve, too, Terry. Uh, I think uh, there's an imprimatur of the mm -hmm. maestro that uh, Greenspan gave us of how he was the world's second most powerful man that Bernanke picked up and gave the impression that he really knew something about what he was doing with his uh, Princeton economics uh, PhD. In fact, what he's been doing is quite simple and predictable, printing money. That means destroying the currency by supposedly bailing it out. People say, well, but when it's necessary, he will do the reverse. No, he won't, guys. Wake up. This is the guy that has brought us more bailouts and printing money than has ever existed in the full history of the Federal Reserve in the last two, three years, since the 2008 crisis. And the way he did it was such a way that wasn't inflationary as you might expect. He did it to drive rates down so the government could stay alive, as Doug's pointed out. If rates were higher, the government would be even more out of business. 
but the Fed did it in such a way that it was kept on the books of the banks and not in uh, flowing out to the rest of the economy. So we haven't seen large inflation, and he has been able to drive rates down well below what would normally be expected with a bankrupt government. But that's not going to last, folks. This thing will come collapsing. Well, let's, let's talk about the, about the uh, Fed, because it's a, it's a good segue there. Is, Terry, you've, you've studied this stuff quite a bit. Um, is there anything, let's say, I mean, from a fiscal policy standpoint, from a political standpoint, I mean, the, the, the budget deficits that they have proposed, or the, or the cuts, are just a, a joke. Uh, Bud sent around this great cartoon this morning showing this gigantic hog labeled uh, U.S. debt, and, and uh, they were saying that the bottom, the politicians were saying, well, maybe we can take a little off his toenails. And, uh, <laughs> you know, that was sort of it. But so what about monetary policy? Uh, can the great Bernanke and company save the day somehow? Well, poor Mr. Bernanke is like the fellow who's been dropped off on the median down the middle of the freeway. Uh, for, for the last few years, since the end of 2008, uh, he's been watching the recessionary traffic coming, and it keeps coming, and he keeps throwing money at it uh, to try and find a path to get across the freeway. He still can't do it. Eventually, all the money that's been printed, and it's been about better than a 40% expansion in the money supply since the end of uh, 2008, uh, it, that will have an effect. It will take hold, and it will produce a kind of false spring for the economy, and that will be followed in short order by rapid inflation. And then Mr. Bernanke for a while will turn to the other direction of freeway traffic and try to deal with uh, inflation by slowing down the growth rate in the money supply. And, but that's going to throw the economy back into a recession. And I don't know how many cycles there will be back and forth, uh, but uh, the trend will be to higher and higher rates of inflation. And I'm afraid there's just no way for Mr. Bernanke to get home. Summing up the first segment of the program, um, it is clear by the scale and the nature of the, the, the crisis at this point that things are likely, from our perspective, to get a whole lot worse before they get better and could, before this is over, lead to even a systematic breakdown um, of the economy, maybe from a political standpoint, even a social standpoint. Um, now, in a minute, we're going to talk about some of the investment implications, some of the ways that you can protect yourself and your net worth. But I've always been a big believer, as Bud will attest, to challenging one's assumptions. And uh, to help us do that, I want to welcome in uh, John Malden, and uh, a, an old friend of mine, a, a brilliant uh, financial writer, uh, and the author of a, a just published book uh, entitled Endgame, uh, The End of the Debt Supercycle and How It Changes Everything. And uh, uh, John, welcome to our program of the American Debt Crisis. David, it is always good to be with you, even if it's over video. I look forward and treasure the moments when we're actually together. You're very kind, yes. Now, John, you tend to be something of an optimist. Um, so I'm so only an optimist when I'm with the people at KC Research. Normally when I go out, I'm the pessimist. So let's put this in context. Okay. So uh, hopefully uh, you can bring some, let's say, hope, if you will, to the audience. Uh, are you seeing uh, anything uh, on the economic or political horizon that gives you hope for the economy at this point? Well, it's not clear. And, and that's what gives me hope. If it was clear, one way or another, then we'd all have it down. What gives me hope is that when I talk to serious senior level politicians, uh, Democratic and Republican, in Washington, D.C., more and more of them are getting the issue. They understand that the problem is the deficit and the debt. Now, they're not happy, and when I confront them, whether it's Tea Party or Democrats, with what the result of their policies would be, they don't like to hear the message, but they get it. And I don't think anything is going to happen in 2012 unless it's just, you know, somewhere around the edges. I think in 2013 we will have a historic opportunity for Washington, D.C. to decisively act. And by me decisively acting is 
we put ourselves on a glide path economy to reduce the deficit to below the nominal growth rate of U.S. GDP because the country can run a deficit that large forever and ever. It doesn't make any difference. In that regard, Dick Cheney was right. He never, in his wildest dreams, thought that we, when he said that deficits don't matter, he never thought that we'd be talking one and a half trillion dollars. He was thinking two, three hundred billion. And two or three hundred billion dollars in a fourteen trillion dollar economy don't make any difference. But if we put ourselves on a glide path to reducing the deficit over five or six years, now it puts us into an economic headwind. It in fact means that we're going to have a slow growth economy. It in fact means that unemployment is going to be uncomfortably high. But to me, that's optimistic because we don't hit the wall. We don't become Greece. And uh, we can recover from that after we get through it. So, John, just uh, going back on your sort of uh, hopeful scenario, if you will, at this point, you're basing that entirely on the government, the Republicans and Democrats and the Tea Party guys and the uh, administration all being able to come together and uh, come up with serious solutions as opposed to the, some of the ideas that have been bandied around the last couple of years that, that wouldn't make a dent in the problem. But you're, you're, is your sole hopeful point that these guys are going to somehow discover how to work together? Sadly, David, it is. <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean, I, but but, but I, I, I think there's a growing realization that not doing anything will result in something so horrific that they're going to be scared into doing something. I mean, they, when I talk to them privately, you know, there's no press in the room. They get it. They understand. And they're just as scared as the people listening to this video are. And yet they've got responsibility for it. We don't want to become griefs. We don't want to see 20% unemployment, and we don't want to see a longer-term depression. And that's what we are going to have if we don't deal with the deficit. John, the, uh, the, uh, the talk is cheap, as they say. Um, actions speak louder than words. Uh, where is your portfolio? How do you have your portfolio, in general terms, uh, allocated at this point? That's a, a good question, and, and I want to start with the caveat that if anybody came to me at my age with my responsibilities and showed me a portfolio like I have, I would say that they were nuts. So let's just put this in context. Um, I buy some gold every month. Uh, I take delivery. It goes into a vault. And I do that because I don't trust the bastards. Even though I'm telling you that I think they're going to fix it, just in case they don't, and just in case the Fed decides to go crazy, I want some gold. It's an insurance portfolio. My fondest dream is never to sell it. I want to give it to my great grandkids and I want to be embarrassed when I do because their Papa John collected all these stupid little gold coins. Uh, I'm buying biotech and I'm buying a higher percentage of startup and early stage biotech than I would caution anybody to do. But I spend quite a time uh, looking at it and reviewing it. I think that we're going to be in a bubble in biotech stocks by the end of this decade. And I want to be at the beginning of a bubble, dear God, just once in my life. Uh, the, the, the understand, even though the government could do something really stupid and create an environment that's uncomfortable for everybody, at the worst of the Depression, 80% of the people still had jobs. And that's probably what will happen today. The world doesn't end, and technology and new businesses started right on through the Depression. Nothing slowed down. It didn't slow down through World War II. It doesn't slow down through the Cold War, through Vietnam, through the 70s. I mean, so we're going to see an enormous amount of potential innovation and change. And it's just going to accelerate. So there's going to be lots of opportunity for investments and startups and innovation. So I'm, I'm not, you know, let's go buy uh, food and ammo and, and, and move to the hills. I'm out about looking for stuff. More or less in your portfolio, what percentage is cash at this point? Oh, probably 20, 25% right now. And, and I'm, I'm investing 
less as I make money each month. I'm investing a smaller portion of it than I would normally do and, and building up cash more. Uh, before we, uh, we we're, we're a little short on time, but I'd like to just open it to the panel here. I've got, uh, of course, Terry and Bud and Olivier and Duggar here. Uh, anybody have any questions or comments to John? Doug, oh, I don't uh, know. Uh, Doug, no, John, ahead. listen, I, I agree with just about everything that you've said, uh, ex except I think you're just a wee bit Pollyanna <laughs> about uh, the foresight and prudence of the people you know in Washington. Maybe you're spending too much time around them these days. Well, I don't think, I'm not, I don't want to give them foresight and prudence. I think it's fear. Um, fear is a great motivating factor when they really truly begin to understand how not acting can do something. So um, let's. I'm, I don't want to, you know, sound more Pollyannish, and I and I may very well be, Doug. Uh, I hope I'm not, and I hope you're wrong. And and I, frankly, I think you probably hope you're wrong too. Oh, I I, I hope I'm wrong. I, I hope I am wrong, although, to be quite honest with you, I think these people actually deserve to be hung by their heels from a lamppost, uh, well, many lampposts, actually. That's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, on that note, John, we're going to say goodbye and move on, and I really appreciate you uh, having taken the time to be with us today. Well, it's always fun, and I look forward to the next time we can be together and break some bread. <clears throat> okay, it's time to shift the program into specific ways that w we can help people protect their assets and uh, uh, get through this thing in one piece, if you will, and maybe even make a few bucks along the way. Um, so let's talk about let's talk about in investments. Um, what sort of investments do you think are going to do okay? At, at, certainly in the next little part of this crisis. Uh, I don't know. Doug, you want to lead off with that? Or? Well. I, I think it's critical to have a significant portion of your assets in gold in your own possession. That's number one. That's the foundation. I think it's critical to be diversified internationally so that all of your assets are not under the control of one government uh, because you can count on your government to treat you like a milk cow and if things get bad, they might even treat you like a beef cow. <laughs> uh, but uh, it's possible, since the real wealth in the world, most of the real wealth in the world, will still exist as the Greater Depression develops, uh, it's possible for you to actually grow in wealth, possible, during uh, the time coming up. But there you have to learn to be a speculator. Uh, a speculator being defined as somebody who positions himself to capitalize from politically caused distortions in the marketplace. And uh, speculations, I think that John Malden's uh, thoughts about a bubble developing in, in, in um, uh, biotech stocks, entirely credible, possible. Uh, in addition to that, I would draw attention to junior resource stocks, uh, which have clearly uh, have 50 to 100 to 1 potential in individual issues, and as a group could easily go 1,000% upwards in price. They've done it many times in the past. We'll get back to the various investment alternatives in a moment, but first I do think it's important to contemplate the notion that uh, the monetary system of the U.S. Uh, could falter, if you will. I, I wrote an article recently, actually it was from John Malden's service, uh, pointing out that contrary to popular uh, delusions, the U.S. monetary system has had to be fixed, if you can call it that, a, a dozen or more times since the Civil War, uh, the latest of which, of course, was when Nixon uh, closed the gold window in 1971. So the question uh, it really boils down to, can the monetary system survive intact, and what are the implications if it doesn't? Uh, uh, to help us uh, ponder that question, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first guest, Lou Rockwell, founder of the popular uh, site uh, lourockwell.com. Uh, welcome, Lou. Great to be with you. Nice to have you here. Uh, Lou, considering that the U.S. dollar and that all of the world's currencies are essentially backed by nothing more tangible than promises by politicians to uh, not to misbehave, uh, it seems to me uh, pretty impressive that the monetary system has 
as held up for as long as it has. Uh, do you think it can, can, it can survive the current crisis? Yeah, the question is, can we survive? But yeah, I think, I mean, the dollar, as uh, you certainly know, uh, as well as anybody, has um, undergone vast depreciation ever since the founding of the Federal Reserve back in 1913, and especially since Nixon closed the gold window and we ended up uh, with the first in American currency and then uh, currencies in every other country in the world that are totally fiat, where there's absolutely no restraint on how much money the central banks can create. And so as, uh, because what Nixon did, following up on what Roosevelt and LBJ had done, he, he what he did was he demonetized gold and all, the, all that was left was the dollar. So the dollar can survive a very long time. For some strange reason, people all over the world think of it as still a safe haven, and maybe, and maybe it is as compared to their own local currencies. Because some of this is suddenly out of their control. We all remember, if we're old enough anyway, back to the 1970s, when we had the highest uh, inflation of my lifetime. Uh, and it was uh, stopped by Paul Volcker. I always find it so interesting that in those days, the the banking community, if we can call that a group of uh, people a community, uh, wanted to stop the inflation. And so uh, Volcker was appointed by Carter to head the Federal Reserve, and he actually cut the money supply. He didn't just decrease the rate of increase, which is enough to bring on a recession, as happened here recently, uh, but he actually cut the money supply. Interest rates went way up, you know, we had uh, mortgages you know, 23 percent and that sort of thing. Um, but it stopped it, it broke the back of the inflation. Um, these days, the whole banking community, uh, the government itself, of course, the rest of the regime, seem to be dedicated towards QE, I mean, more and more money printing. So they think they can keep control of this, but, you know, they only hold in their hands control over the supply of money. They don't hold control over uh, the demand for money. We, we actually don't know. We're in uncharted territory. Well, back in the 70s, of course, <clears throat> you know, Volcker had the option of of addressing a, a problem uh, through an obvious, in hindsight, solution of, of uh, raising interest rates and cutting the money supply. This time around, of course, we've got this massive debt that we didn't have back in the 70s. So their policy options, if you will, seem to be rather limited. And, and as we've discussed at some length during this program so far, uh, there's no political will or maybe even a political ability to, to actually address the debt and the deficit. So. Uh, do you see any outlier there in terms of a Volcker-like dramatic move that the government could make? Well, there are things the government could do, you know, highly unlikely, we can say. Uh, the, only, the only moral uh, and economic and uh, properly political thing they could do is to repudiate the debt. I mean, that is what, that is the, when you, when you have, have this sort, this size debt and with the liabilities, right, what, what are we, we're talking what, a hundred trillion dollars? Who, who knows? We don't actually know because government accounting is about as accurate and competent as, as the rest of the government, and of course they lie too, so we don't actually know, but again, there's never been a debt like this ever. Of course, um, uh, there's huge private debt, individuals are in far too much debt, companies are in far too much debt. As a result of Federal Reserve policy, as a result of the, hu of the uh, humongous swelling of the entire financial sector, too many banks, too many stock brokers, or brokerages, just the, the whole financial sector is, is gigantic and of course the debt is gigantic. It can't be paid off. I mean they can either inflate or they can tax us and I, I would argue they can't actually tax us because there would be a revolution. Uh, even in this, even among the American sheeple, we would see a revolution if they tried to raise taxes sufficiently to pay that off. So what, what they're going to do is inflate rather than inflate. They should repudiate because of course the people who are the bondholders uh, don't have a contract with the poor people who are going to be crushed in order to pay off the bonds and the rest of and the and uh, all the all the government debt. So repudiation is the only proper way. Uh, Murray Rothbard wrote about this very eloquently. Um, and there were, of course, there have been repudiations in American history, not by the central government, except a gradual repudiation of inflation. But state governments repudiated their debts in the 19th century and had a wonderful effect. First of all, again, you're not crushing the taxpayers for the benefit of, uh, of the regime and its, and its allies. And another great thing is it's very difficult for a government to borrow after it repudiates. Well, Lou, as you know, I agree with you on almost everything that you've ever said, quite frankly. But uh, I, I hate to think that you may be a 
a bit too optimistic uh, in, in what you're looking at here. And the reason I say that is this. Perhaps what's going on in the back of some of these government officials' minds is if we really and truly destroy the U.S. dollar, we'll wipe out all our debt, we'll wipe out all our obligations. And of course, people like you and I might think, well, hey, that's going to be uh, perhaps the good news about that is at that point, the U.S. government will be forced to cut back its military spending and uh, abolish agencies and everything. But maybe just the opposite will happen. Maybe they'll use that as an excuse to really grab the economy in a stranglehold uh, and try to make people believe they're really uh, critically necessary, not completely unnecessary. I mean, Doug, I'm sorry to say you remind me of what happened in the Roman Empire when they, um, uh, of course, inflated so that the, uh, the denarius, which had been a silver coin, became just a copper coin coated in silver. And when there were huge inflations, price and wage controls under Diocletian, famously. Uh, however, they continued to pay the legions and other military and uh, police forces in gold. Everybody else had to put up with the, infl the inflated currency. So they knew where their bread was buttered. And uh, my guess is they would pay the, the American legions are going to be paid in, in something significant, uh, not in depreciating paper dollars maybe at some point. I hope that's wrong, but it's a frightening thought. Briefly, um, looking at the current situation, uh, certainly in the U.S., is there uh, any chance under what might be termed a degrading democracy that the politicians can actually solve this problem? And again, you, you're, uh, in, in terms of, let's say, replacing the government, uh, the majority of the people, I believe, at this point don't pay much of any taxes, any income taxes at least. Uh, so there is, there is, there wouldn't be popular support, I don't think, for a lot of the sort of uh, free market policies that, that uh, we would, we would all agree are necessary at this point. So, I mean, do you actually think that in the in the current setup, at any time in the foreseeable future, do you see that there being a enough of an upswelling of um, libertarian, uh, anarchist, if you will? Uh, uh, sentiment that it could actually could actually force the government into some sort of a productive action versus the unproductive action that it constantly takes? Not yet. Uh, however, as the economy gets worse, I think there's already, I, I think already a lot of people are ready for a change that maybe don't know what that change ought to be. And that's why, of course, this kind of a situation can, you can have the man on the white horse as well as a move towards more freedom. Uh, but there's a whole lot more knowledge about what we ought to do um, but we do face the problem of democracy. You mentioned democracy. I mean, democracy is probably the most brilliant uh, invention that the state has ever come up with. I mean, it actually makes people think that we're the government. You hear Americans say, well, we, you know, should we go to the moon? Should we, you know, give uh, school lunch programs to people in Arizona or whatever? I mean, it's, it's, the, uh, it's, it's the great uh, myth and the great dangerous myth that makes people think that, you know, that they somehow have a stake in the system because of democracy. Uh, Hans Hoppe always points out that in, uh, in a monarchy, it was always clear that the government was separate. These people that lived in Versailles, they dressed in fancy clothes, fancy carriages, they had their palaces and so forth. Nobody thought, we the government. Uh, they understood the government was a separate entity, as of course it is in a democracy too. Um, so we, we have that problem. Uh, people, you know, a lot of people still think that, uh, you know, anybody can be become president. I mean, all the uh, and I guess anybody George Soros picks like Barack Obama can become president, but uh, you know, the, it's not a, that path is not open to the rest of us. We have a very hier hierarchical regime. We have a uh, authoritarian regime uh, tending towards totalitarianism, if I can use Gene Kirkpatrick's taxonomy. And um, so it's hard, but uh, already I think everybody is worried about their economic future as they ought to be. Everybody's worried about their children and their grandchildren and what society is going to be like. No American believes their children are going to be better off than they are unless it's uh, unless you're one of the Rockefellers maybe. But as people get more and more worried, as they get more and more frightened, as they get more and more angry, there's chance for radical change and I, th I would say it's our job to try to do everything we can to make sure that that radical change is in the right direction. I've just got to say that, uh, Lou, you're totally sound. Uh, I enjoy hearing you rap. And when we're both rounded up to put, be put in FEMA, FEMA camps, I'd be pleased to have you as a cellmate. <laughs> Doug, that would be my pleasure. And I feel like it's an, uh, a medal on my chest that you said that. So thank you. 
All right. Well, on that, on that optimistic and upbeat note, we'll, uh, we'll uh, say goodbye. Thank you very much for joining us, Lou. It's been great and uh, very, very interesting. It was an honor. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's spend a little bit more time on gold, and, uh, which along with silver, Casey Research has been recommending since, uh, strongly recommending since it was trading for something like $250 a, a decade or so ago. Um, they've been very important, gold and silver, in preserving the wealth of our subscribers, and a lot of subscribers have made a lot of money and are very happy with that trade. Uh, but now we're getting to the point where gold at over $1,800 feels uh, expensive to some people. It feels like maybe it's in a bubble. And uh, so to help us sort of understand how things now uh, are likely to play out on the gold side, I'd like to introduce <coughs> our next guest, uh, Michael Maloney, the CEO and founder of GoldSilver.com. Uh, Mike is an ardent student of, uh, of uh, gold as a monetary metal and as an uh, as a investment and a, a very strong educator. Uh, we first saw him at our conference in Boca Raton. He did a great job. Uh, so good, in fact, we invited him to come back to our next event in Phoenix in October and give the keynote speech. And so we're very happy to have him on this program. Uh, welcome, Mike. It's great to be here. Well, in the interest of time, uh, let's just jump to the question that so many people have right now. Uh, a lot of people are just now waking up to the situation in this country, uh, and they're looking at the price of gold and saying, oh, it's too late, I missed the big move. Uh, so have they missed the big move? Absolutely not. Uh, in this decade, I believe we're going to see a currency crisis. Uh, if there was no currency crisis, gold still is not overvalued yet. It hasn't reached fair value. Uh, it has to reach the point to where gold's price is about one quarter the points of the Dow just to get to fair value. Uh, so if you measure it against a single family median price home or a share of the Dow or other asset classes, you'll discover that gold is still fundamentally undervalued. Um, it's not as undervalued as it was a decade ago, but you know, the very first time that I bought gold, I bought it at about $315 an ounce. And right away, the price started taking off. It, it just happened to be I bought at the end of a consolidation period. It had been stagnant for a couple months. I bought the very next day it starts going up. And I'm going, should I buy more? Should I buy more? No, I'll wait for a pullback. And it's going up past $350, $375. Finally, it hits $392. I rush into the bullion dealer. I uh, make another purchase, and the very next day it starts to fall. And it fell all the way to 325, and it took about a year to get back up past 392. And I just punished myself for that year for buying at a peak, thinking that I had actually lost something during that time that it fell from 392 to 325. And I wish I could go back and make that same mistake today a hundredfold. $392 gold, are you kidding me? The people that think that $1,900 is high are just going to be kicking themselves in the butt when gold is $5,000 an ounce. Mike, one of the things that I, uh, <clears throat> I had sort of a, something of a wake-up call, well, this goes back uh, probably six months ago, I was on a plane with, uh, sitting next to somebody who had, didn't have any investments in gold and, and didn't know much about it, a very smart woman, but she started asking me questions, started talking, and following that conversation, she went out and started to do some research. and. She called me up uh, oh, about a month ago and said, you know, I, I, I got what you were saying on the plane. I understand it. I have now gone in uh, the Internet. I've talked to people. I've studied the whole question of gold and different things. And she goes, I read some people say, uh, you know, buy GLD. And other people say that GLD is uh, a horrible idea. That some people say buy, uh, you know, the big gold stocks. And some people say stay away from them. Uh, some people say buy numismatics. So anyway, during the course of the conversation, I, I realized because I think we all have been around a, a long time and we understand the sort of fundamentals of gold. But I think there's a lot of people out there who are now waking up to the need to try to protect themselves with gold, but really don't know where to yeah. where to start. So a, a sort of a two part question. One is where do you start and and what are the sort of investments you would recommend for somebody who's just getting into this? Well, one of the things that I always say is if you can't hold it, you don't own it. Uh, I believe, I'm a firm believer in having your core position in gold and silver bullion coins and bars. 
I don't like numismatics. And basically, everything else is a derivative. D GLD is a derivative of gold. It is not gold. These are shares that are in a trust that's being administered by some of the world's largest banks. Uh, and those banks are what got us in the financial crisis through all their leverage. Uh, the, if you read their prospectuses and uh, 10K filings with the Securities and Exchange Commission, you'll discover loophole after loophole that they've created so that uh, nobody goes to jail if it was discovered that they don't have all the gold and, or silver bullion backing up these, uh, these uh, ETFs that they say they do. Uh, so I, uh, right now, the gold and silver markets are heavily leveraged, and it's just like a game of mu musical chairs, and you've got 100 people dancing around the room, and there's one chair, and the guy that actually owns that gold coin is sitting in it already. <laughs> and the music is going to stop pretty soon. <laughs> the music stops with a currency crisis or a default on the commodities exchange or something like that. And uh, the, uh, when people start deleveraging, there's going to be a scramble for real physical gold and silver and not a promise to pay gold and silver. Uh, I certainly agree with everything you're saying, Mike. Um, do you have any feelings as to what the political and social consequences of this upheaval might be, though? Now, this is some, some place where you should have some fear. I, I don't have any fear when it comes to the economic consequences. I know that I am going to do very, very well and anybody that protects themselves with gold and silver, they aren't just protecting themselves, they are going to make massive gains out of this. But the one thing that we should fear is the loss of our freedom. And with great currency crisis comes great political change, and it's always for the worse. If you study history, this is where Napoleon came from, Mao, Hitler. Uh, this is the thing that we have to watch for in all uh, countries that have any semblance of freedom. We have to watch for the rise of dictators, the rise of people that claim that they've got the answer, charismatic people that, that uh, give us a scapegoat and show us the way out of this thing. Uh, all they're doing, th this enslaves people. So this is the thing that we have to really watch out for and the thing we have to stick up for. And you know, the best way to do it is still with, gold and silver sort of represent freedom. They represent not just financial freedom, but there's a liberty to it. Uh, when you, I'm, I'm, I wrote an article a while back called Gold Standards Suck. And gold is great because the free market keeps on picking it. Time after time after time throughout the centuries, without fail, the free market picks gold and silver as money. Uh, it gets corrupted when a government says, oh, we'll keep this uh, gold in, in, in the vault for you and we'll create this national currency that has our pictures on it and, and our numbers, and uh, you can use this in circulation, but if you go to another country and you cross that, you go past that currency exchange window, it goes to zero. <laughs> it gives, it creates the ability, gold purchases about the same amount all over the planet. You can go, whether you, if you take an American gold eagle or uh, some other coin, whatever weight of gold is in that coin, uh, purchases you about the same amount in Europe as it does in the United States, as it does in Singapore or Japan or Australia. It doesn't really matter. So it's an international currency and governments don't have as much control over it. Uh, with national currencies, that is part of, of how governments control your life. Uh, so gold represents freedom. I can't remember what the question was, but that's my statement. <laughs> Okay, well, I think that's, uh, that's, that uh, pretty much covers what we wanted to cover this, uh, today with you. And uh, if that's, I uh, really appreciate you, you uh, stopping by and, and uh, sharing those thoughts here. Very good. Very useful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, one last thing again, if anybody wants to add any form of leverage to gold and silver, don't go with margined trading accounts. Don't go with numismatics. Go with the stocks, and to do that, you have to get advice by signing up, uh, subscribing to somebody that, that has been studying mining companies for years and years and years, knows the people and knows the geology. And so uh, typically that's through a newsletter. So anyway, uh, those are the things to watch for. Before we get off of gold, I, I just something that I, I think is, uh, again, for people that are new to, the, new to gold, 
and don't really have a proper context, if you will, uh, they sort of assume that there's some magical reason that gold is, is valuable. And Doug, you've, why don't you give your quick five reasons that, uh, that gold actually is money and a monetary mm -hmm. metal? Well, they're actually not mine. They were originated by Aristotle in the uh, fourth century BC. And he was the first to identify why, or, or let me put it this way, what makes a, for good money. And there are five characteristics he put his finger on. It has to be durable, divisible, convenient, consistent, and a value of itself. Uh, a good money must be durable. That's why we can't use wheat as money, because it rots after a, a short period of time. It's got to be divisible. Uh, that's why we can't use artwork for money. You can't make change for the Mona Lisa. Uh, it's got to be convenient. That's why we don't use lead as money. It, it takes far too much of it to be of value. It's got to be consistent. That's why we don't use, for instance, real estate as money, because they're not comparable. Every piece is different from every other piece. And it's got to be of value in itself. That's why we don't use paper as money. What? Like, <laughs> well, we do, Doug. <laughs> that's a distinction that's been lost. Uh, paper is currency. It represents money. Money is a value in itself. It's like the coins in your pocket today. They're not actually coins, they're tokens. They used to be coins when they were made out of gold and silver. Now they're technically tokens. But people lose these distinctions and they don't adequately define words. And if you don't define words adequately, then you don't know what you're talking about, quite frankly. So, Well, let's uh, move on quickly then, because we're running a bit long here. One, one of the things that Mike mentioned was gold stocks. And while we cover uh, a number of gold stock plays in the Casey Report. Uh, uh, there, we have other services at Casey Research, uh, the International Speculator, Casey Investment Alert, that actually do specialize in, in gold stocks, uh, juniors and also producing. But, but uh, just sort of make sure we're covering the ground here. Uh, the advantage for those of you who aren't following uh, or new to gold, uh, gold stocks, is that they offer leverage uh, to the gold price. For example, if a, if a mine produces a million ounces of gold uh, and they're receiving $900 per ounce for their gold they produce and gold goes to $1,800, that obviously has uh, real benefits to the bottom line. Um, their gold stocks have lagged gold recently, which would suggest either the gold bullion has gone a little bit too far or the gold stocks have got to do some catching up. Doug, do you have an opinion on that? Well, I. I'd start by saying that gold mining, any kind of mining, is basically a crappy business. Uh, you've got a huge capital investment up front, and you can't move that capital investment, so it's a target for the government to tax it and regulate it and so forth. Uh, it's a 19th century choo-choo train kind of business, which is why it's been held in such low, disre low regard in the day of the internet and high technology. But uh, that said, uh, sometimes uh, it's a great value. And because the total market cap of all the gold stocks in the world, certainly the small ones, which interest me because they're volatile, because, because it, it's so small, uh, these things can have gigantic moves. Gold stocks are the most volatile class of securities on the planet. They're more volatile than the internet stocks. Now you're the talking late 90s. about the juniors versus the, the bigger producers are not so volatile. You're not talking so about volatile. the exploration companies, companies that go yeah. out and look for the stuff, they find it, they get a they hit a discovery and their shares go through the city. Exactly. And I'm much more interested in the juniors because like any big company which is not run by its founders, the big mining companies tend to be bureaucratic and stodgy and not interested. I'm interested in the small companies that have small market caps and are still run by the entrepreneurs that founded them. Those have historically shown that, yes, you can get 10 to 1, you can get 100 to 1 in returns. Risky, but the possibility is there. Well, the risk on that, just again, so because we don't want people rushing out and buying things that they don't understand, you need to, as Mike said, you need to follow you need to have somebody who knows what they're talking about help you no, out on that stuff. There's 5,000 of them traded in Canada right. alone, yeah. and most of them are crap. The only gold they have is in the name on their <laughs> stock certificates. So you yes, have to be and uh, probably 95, 98% of them will never be a gold mine, and they are 
they are dangerous and risky, but if you know the players, if you know who's really got the goods and not, then they can be a great return, but go easy on that sort of diversification. Um, other things, um, we talked a little about oil. I know, Doug, you had a, a, a quick opinion on oil. It's going to go up for political reasons, but also for geological reasons. The geological reasons were uh, laid out by M. King Hubbard in the 50s. Uh, he went into a concept called peak oil, which is basically that all of the easy to find light, sweet crude has been discovered. And the oil we're finding now is either hard to process, it's heavy, it's sour, or it's located at the bottom of the ocean, 5,000 feet under it. So that from a strictly geological perspective, uh, oil is going to become harder to find, therefore it's going to become more expensive in the future. We're never going to run out of oil, don't worry about that. It's just going to become much more expensive, point number one. Point number two, it's a very political commodity. It's the most, in terms of dollar volume, the most heavily traded commodity in the world. And most of it comes from very unstable parts of the world, like the Middle East, where I, 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 I just visited four countries there. And that place is a, a tinderbox. So uh, uh, I've, got to be, uh, I've got to be bullish on oil for both geological and political reasons. Speaking at this of point. tinderbox, uh, I mean, they're just a, from a, because it's in the news, Libya. Uh, a lot of people look at what's going on in Libya and they say, well, the U.S. and its allies have won one against the bad guys. Do, do you think that that's going to work out for the U.S. in the end? No, this is completely insane. Uh, we're going to look back on the days when, when Gaddafi had that place under control as being a halcyon era, just as you can look at Iraq and, and uh, miss Saddam Hussein, because at least he was keeping a, a lid on the boiling cauldron. No, they're going to have a civil war in Libya with a half a dozen or a dozen different groups fighting each other. And the winners are going to be the Chinese, quite frankly. Uh, these idiotic Western European uh, countries and the U.S. are the ones that are you know, putting billions of dollars into, into this, and they're, they're going to be the losers. It's terrible. Okay, moving right along. Uh, Bud, you live in Silicon Valley, and of course we've got a, a, a service as well, uh, Casey's Extraordinary Technology, which follows uh, um, interesting technologies. I mean, the, the world is advancing after all. I mean. What's, what's the mood in Silicon Valley? What's just, what do you think about tech? Great. I'm glad you asked, David. Maybe you can help me with a prop. Can you hold up the little thing in front of you, <laughs> in front of the camera, yes, just enough to sort of show yeah, what's going on? Of course, this on. is the iPad, yes, which you can play videos and keep things on and all your documents. And I don't, I don't, I don't travel with a laptop anymore. I just travel with this. But uh, Yeah, and the world's changing for much the better. Uh, Steve Jobs grew up in the house across the street, and my kids went to the same high school he did. Here's these phones. You're not going to have to carry with you anything that looks very big to do all your future communications. And what you're going to communicate about are really fun things, like the social networking things. Lots of things are happening in Silicon Valley. Our housing price hasn't dropped much. Uh, inventories are low. People are happy in the sense of, of a new fancy technologies, not only the biotechnology mentioned by uh, John Malden earlier, but certainly communications, uh, Google, uh, Yahoo, uh, well, not so uh, excitingly Hewlett Packard, but certainly Apple and others in Silicon Valley, and many of the small startups also offer opportunities. And frankly, technology is the direction of the future, recreation of wealth. So knowing where it's going is not only beneficial to you just for surviving the normal uh, pan uh, lifestyle requirements, it's a good thing to invest in, and we watch that closely, too, as an optimistic opportunity for the future. And, and let me add something to that. It's a, I know we've sounded very gloomy uh, about the economy, about the financial world, about uh, the political world, everything. But um, I've got to say that uh, the long term is not only better than we imagine, but better than we can imagine. And there are two reasons why this is true, even if governments get completely out of control and even more destructive than they've been in the past. And here are the two reasons. Number one, individuals will continue to do things that are good for themselves. And that generally means each individual will tend to produce more than he consumes and save the difference. 
and that builds capital, and that's how the world gets wealthier, regardless of the stupidity of governments. Number two is technology. Uh, since the Industrial Revolution started 200 years ago, technology has been building and compounding upon itself at an accelerating rate, and I think that will continue. So this story will have a happy ending. We're just going through a very rough patch along the way. Well, we're at the end of our program now, and obviously this is a very big topic. There's an awful lot more uh, that could be said about it. We can get a lot more into the investments and the strategies and the things that you can do to, to help yourself. Uh, but I think there's one thing that's, that's pretty obvious, or should be, which is that this is going to be a very challenging time, and this is not a time to try to go it alone. And uh, it, it's, it, these guys all, all work. Uh, you can't believe how hard they work. Um, day and night watching the markets and watching the economy and trying to keep ahead of, of the latest government action, if you will. And it's, it's not an easy job, and it's, um, but it's essential. And we question our, we question our uh, viewpoints constantly. We push back, as again, Bud and Terry and Doug will say, that, uh, that we constantly challenge our assumptions, trying to find, to make sure that we don't miss that big turn in the road. Because the reality is that trying to go it alone in this market is, could get you wiped out. You could end up with nothing. This has happened time and time again in history where people thought they were all set, they, 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 they didn't sort of see the Huns coming over the border, if you will, and, and were totally wiped out. So um, at Casey Research, we are, our business is providing this sort of information, helping people watch the market. We cover a lot of different sectors, everything from energy to technology to some of the junior uh, resource stocks that Doug was talking about. And, um, you know, it's all of our services, I would just say, they come with a uh, three-month free trial. And you can try them. You don't like them. You cancel. You're not going to hurt our feelings. It uh, costs you nothing to give them a try. And I think that, that this is the kind of uh, point in time where you just can't go alone. And you certainly don't want to be relying on a, let's say, a financial planner or your broker. Uh, somebody whose mental construct just doesn't, uh, include the fact that this sort of thing could happen. The same people who missed this crisis in the first place are, will tell you today, oh, gold's overpriced, or you know, don't worry about it, the government will sort everything out. But in reality, uh, that's just not going to happen. We're going to go through a period in time that is going to be quite remarkable, and there are certain steps you have to take, uh, and if you don't, you, the, there could be quite serious consequences uh, on a lot of different levels. So. Um, that pretty much wraps it up. I, think, I know, Olivier, uh, after this, you've worked on a briefing with the team that's going to sort of recap, I think, some of the key points. Right, to make sure that, you know, all, our, uh, all the people that are viewing this uh, video have a chance to really digest some of the information we brushed over. We actually have summarized some of the major, acts, uh, major uh, points that, uh, and steps that you might want to follow to uh, start the process of protecting yourself. Right. So uh, that data will be uh, sent to. That will be sent by email in the next few days. Okay. So watch for that, and and you know feel free to pass this along. Obviously, obviously, our we want to get exposure for Casey Research to more people, but you, frankly, you're doing them a, a big favor because it's amazing how many people. If you walk outside right now and go talk to the first ten people you run into on the street or down at the local club, and ask them what their views are on the economy and on gold, you'll get a very uh, sort of wishy-washy, well, uh, things are concerning sort of a viewpoint, but they don't really understand. And, and, and uh, to not understand what's going on and, and taking steps to protect yourself could be quite a serious uh, mistake. So with that, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you very much uh, to all of uh, our panelists here and to our guest. Um, it's been, uh, it's been, I was going to say it's been fun. <laughs> it's been interesting. And uh, I hope it's been uh, of some values. And thank you uh, to the audience for uh, stopping by.